Hi everyone, this is Charlotte and um, I'm going to be reading you a book called A House Called Awful End by Philip Ardag. Ardag. It is um, the first in the Eddie Dickens trilogy. Um, I read this book when I was a lot smaller um, younger and I thought it was completely hilarious, it felt a little stupid. Um, also, I'd like to apologise, my um, camera battery was actually dying, so I had to plug it in, so um, this right here is the charger, so I apologise if it gets in the way, um, but I really wanted to make this video. I'm just going to be reading the first chapter, perhaps the first two, I only have about 12 minutes left on this camera, um, before I had to upload videos off of it, um, and get rid of some, or I'll say, open some space. So, um, this is the front picture, which I think is rather funny. Um, you'll see these two later on. And that's Eddie Dickens. Um, the pages are falling apart a bit, but I apologise. That's just the forward table of contents. And here it starts. Episode 1, Crinkly Around the Edges, in which Eddie Dickens is sent away for his own good. When Eddie Dickens was 11 years old, both his parents got some awful disease that made them turn yellow, go a bit crinkly around the edges, smell of old hot water bottles. There were lots of diseases like that in those days. Perhaps that had something to do with that thick fog, those knobbly cobbled streets, and the fact that everyone went everywhere but horse, even to the bathroom. Who knows? It's very contagious, said his father, and catching, said his mother, sucking on an ice cube shaped like the famous general. They were in Eddie's parents' bedroom, which was very dark and dingy and had no furniture in it, except for a large double bed and an even larger wardrobe, and 32 different types of chair designed to make you sit up straight even if your wrists were handcuffed to your ankles. Why are you sucking an ice cube shaped like a famous general? Eddie asked his parents, who were propped up against pillars, piles of pillows in their impressively ugly double bed. Dr. Muffin says it helps with the swelling, said his mother. In fact, because she had a famous journal-shaped ice cube in her mouth, what she actually said was, Dr. Muffin shares very hips with, with swelling. But Eddie managed to translate. What's swelling? he asked politely. His mother shrugged, then suddenly looked even more yellow and even more crinkly around the edges. And why do they have to be famous general-shaped? asked Eddie. He always asked lots of questions, and whenever he asked lots of questions, his father would say, Questions, 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 said his father. Told you. But why a famous general? Eddie repeated. Surely the shape of the ice cube can't make any difference. Shows how much you know, muttered his mother, which meant, and still means, shows how much you know. His father rustled the bedclothes. One does not question the good doctor, he said, especially when one is a child. He was a small man except for when he was sitting up in bed. In this position, he looked extremely tall. Then Eddie's mother rustled the bedclothes. It was easy to make them rustle because they were made entirely from brown paper bags glued together with those extra strips of gum paper you sometimes get if you buy more than one stamp at the post office. Postage stamps were a pretty new idea back then. Everyone, except for a great-great-aunt on my mother's side of the family, was excited about them. One good thing about there being so few stamps in those days was that no one had yet come up with the idea of collecting them and sticking them in albums, being really boring about them. Stamp collectors didn't exist. Another good thing about there being no stamp collectors was that the English teachers couldn't sneak up on some defenseless child and ask it how to spell philatus. Which, by the way, there's a little note here. I don't know if you can see the small star next to the it. And at the bottom it says, Teachers even thought of a child as it back then. Some things never change. Anyhow, anyhow, even for those days, having brown paper bedclothes wasn't exactly usual. Quite the opposite, in fact. Bedclothes used to be an even grander affair than they are now. There were no polyester filled duvet, duvets, duvets, with separate washable covers. Oh no, back then there were under blankets and under sheets and top sheets and middle sheets and several different kinds of over blankets. They used to range from ones thicker than a plank of wood, but not nearly as soft. They're not so soft. So ones that had holes in them that were supposed to be there. To make a bed properly, the average chambermaid went through six to eight weeks training at a special camp. Even then, not all of them finished the course, and those that didn't finish spent the rest of their working lives living in cupboards under stairs. The cupboard under the stairs of the Dickens household was occupied by Jim and Jane. She spent her days in the darkness, alongside a variety of mops, 
buckets and brooms, mumbling about hospital corners and rugged chenal. She never came out and was fed slices of ham and any other food that was thin enough to slip under the bottom of the door. The reason why Mr. and Mrs. Dickens had rustling, was, had rustling brown paper sheets and blankets was that this was a part of the treatment. Dr. Muffin was always giving very strict instructions about the treatment. The smell of old hot water bottles had almost reached unbearable on Eddie's what I'm prepared to breathe scale. He held his hanky up to his face. You'll have to leave the room, my boy, said his father. You'll have to leave the house, said his mother. We can't risk you going all yellow and crinkly and smelling horrible. It would be a terrible waste of all that money we spent on turning you into a little gentleman. Which is why we're sending you to stay with Mad Uncle Jack, his father explained. I didn't know I had a Mad Uncle Jack, gasped Eddie. He'd never heard of him. It sounded rather an exciting relative to have. I didn't say you're Mad Uncle Jack. He's my Mad Uncle Jack, said his father. I do wish you'd listen. That makes him your great uncle. Oh, said Eddie, disappointed. You mean Mad Great Uncle Jack. Then he realized he hadn't heard of him either, and he sounded just as exciting as the other one. When will I meet him? He's in the wardrobe, said his mother, pointing at the huge wardrobe at the foot of the bed, in case her son had forgotten what a wardrobe looked like. By the way, this is the man that we are about to meet. Eddie D- Dickens pulled open the door to the win- wardrobe gingerly. It was a ginger wardrobe. Inside, among his mother's dresses, stood a very, very tall and very, very thin man with a nose that made a parrot's beak look not so beaky. Hello, he said, with a U and not an E. It was ve- very definitely a hello and not a hello. Man Uncle Jack put out his hand. Eddie shook it. His little gentleman lessons hadn't been completely wasted. Mad Uncle Jack stepped out of the wardrobe and onto an oval mat. Knitted by children from St. Horrid's Home for Grateful Orphans. Remember that place, St. Horrid's Home for Grateful Orphans. There, I've written it out for you a second time. Never let it be said that I don't do anything for you. Remember the name. I'll come across it again one day and probably between the covers of this book. So you are Edmund Dickens, said Mad Uncle Jack, studying the boy. Yes, sir, said Eddie, because his first name really was Edmund. Eddie Dickens's father cleared his throat. He used a miniature version of the sort of brush the local sweep used to clear block chimneys. This was all a part of Dr. Muffin's treatment. Edmund, said Mr. Dickens, you are to go away with my uncle and live with him until your dear sweet mother and I. He paused and kissed Mrs. Dickens on the part of her face that was the least yellow and the least crinkly at the edges, a small section just behind her left ear. All well again. You must never wear anything green in his presence. You must always drink at least five glasses of lukewarm water a day. You must always do as he says. Is that clear? Yes, father, said Eddie. And Jonathan, added mother, added his mother, for Jonathan was his pet name she called Eddie when she couldn't remember his real one. Yes, mother, do be careful to make sure that you're not mistaken for a runaway orphan and taken to the orphanage, or you will then suffer, suffer cruelty, hardship, and misery. Don't worry, mother. That'll never happen, said Eddie Dickens dismissing the idea as ridiculous. If only he'd listened. Mad Uncle Jack wanted to use the bathroom before he went, and being unfamiliar with the house, he found it difficult to get his horse up the stairs without knocking one or two family portraits off the wall. The fact that he'd only nailed the portraits up there himself minutes before made it all the more annoying. He took the paintings with him whenever he stayed more than eleven miles from his house. Because his house was actually twelve miles from the nearest place, that meant he had them with them always. A key part of the treatment was that neither Mr. Dickens nor his wife, Mrs. Dickens, should leave the bed more than two, three times a day, because they had all, both already been up twice that day, both planned to get up later for an arm-wrestling competition against their friends and neighbours, Mr. and Mrs. Thackeray, lived over at the Grange. Neither, the Eddie's par- neither of Eddie's parents could get to, up to see him off. Instead, the bed was lowered from the window on a winch, constructed from the sheets that were no longer in use since the treatment had begun. "'Good luck, my boy,' said Eddie's father. "'Under such extreme circumstances, I would kiss you, "'but I don't want you catching this.' "'Get well, father,' said Eddie. "'Be good, Simon,' said his mother. "'Simon was the name Mrs. Dickens used "'when she couldn't remember that his real name was Edmund "'or that his pet name was Jonathan. "'Be good.' "'I will,' said Eddie. "'Get well, mother.' "'It had started to rain, and the, tear drops mixed, the raindrops mixed with the tears "'that poured down his mother's face. "'She was busy peeling an onion.' That is the end of what is called episode one, rather than chapter one, and I hope you have enjoyed this chapter. I will be uploading the second chapter as soon as I have enough memory cleared on my camera. I hope you enjoyed, and thank you for watching. Good night. Bye.